Okay, everybody, we're going to go for rehearsal, okay? In this week's show... Is that okay? Okay, Damon. In this week's show. In okay. this week's show. Yeah, okay. Okay, give me more. Okay. okay. In this week's show. In this week's show. In this week's show. Mm -hmm. In this week's show. No, 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 no. More. Okay. In this week's show. Mm. In this week's show, Icelandic drivers have perfected a way of not getting it right the first time. The passengers in Sidecar Cross can't afford to get it wrong. Stock car drivers seem to be heading in the right direction. Which is more than can be said about Dutch motorsport. Drag bike riders can never, ever make a mistake. Remember, when you're driving, left is left. And right is right. Up is up. And down is down. At least it is in the city. But some people like a drive in the country. Or climbing cliffs, which involves an entirely different set of driving rules altogether. An entirely different set of driving rules. In the US, to fulfill the need to climb skywards, they've created Gravelrama, a Midwest gathering of those addicted to getting high, which might sound unlikely in the Bible Belt, but the raison d'etre is the Big L, the Big Eliminator, which is a 110-foot man-made hill constructed of fine sand that jeeps of varying shapes and sizes try to get to the top of in the shortest possible time. The key to doing this, apparently, is ridiculously large tyres with scoops, alcohol-guzzling supercharged engines that throw out 600 horsepower, and the ability to drive without seeing where you're going. Our old friend Bigfoot has even attempted the Big L. But to be honest, the Americans are the bridesmaids to the Icelandic brides. If you want four-wheel cliff climbing, go to Iceland. They've been trying to perfect it for years. Just popping to the local shop involves negotiating the old volcano or glacial river. Icelandic Formula Off-Road, in its present form, has existed for 25 years. It isn't just about trying to climb vertical cliffs or get to the bottom of them as quickly as possible, although, to be honest, that's 90% of it. Part of the skill is to scare the pants off everyone who's not surrounded by a metal cage. And then make a quick getaway. It's actually a time trial with eight courses that competitors must negotiate in the shortest possible time, without touching any of the marked gates. The courses simulate natural terrain, like rivers, treacherous volcanic slopes, and bottomless bogs. If you touch the gates within the obstacle courses and vertical climbs, you lose points. In order to get the most points and win, You'll need a 1,000 brake horsepower V8, a 1970s disco smoke machine, and it might help to have a four-wheel drive. Well, then again, it might not. But if four wheels just aren't your thing, in the States, they've created the Widowmaker, an appropriately named two-wheel drive up a hill just outside San Francisco. Again, the basic principle is to get to the top of the hill in the fastest time without coming off, but if it worked like that every time, who'd bother coming?
There is a version of this in Europe at Rakow in Austria, but the Americans have taken hill climbing one step further. They've created the Unlimited class. These bikes run on methanol and use metal paddles on the tyres to gain more traction up the hill. Part bike, part D machine, the bikes are stretched to prevent them from flipping over, which doesn't always work, of course. And metal paddles and flesh don't sit well together. This is what it's like to spill. Now, this had happened to me about five years ago. I hit a rock on this hill, and the, the steel paddles, which are these items on the back of the wheel here, came down spinning into my arm, and I about lost my arm. So there you have it, extreme off-road. A vertical challenge where to win, you have to be well and truly over the hill. Balance is everything. Balance can be the difference between winning and losing. Is that a take? After the Second World War, motorcycle dispatch riders found themselves with a motorcycle, too much time on their hands, and nothing to dispatch. And so was born Sidecar Cross. Look, that's not actually true. The important thing is motocross is dangerous, but sidecar cross is madness. In sidecar cross, the passenger puts his life in the driver's hands and the sandwiches in the glove compartment. Popular sport every Saturday. It's half Latvia goes down the uh, track and watch motocross. It's only no one doubt. sport we are no good at because we are mad. No In Latvia, it's a very popular sport, and it's already years back they drive in sidecars, and now it's more popular because we we are on the top of the world championship. Sergis and Rasmus have won more trophies than anyone else simply because they are better at throwing themselves around the track than anyone else. We must work two people like one. One. Yeah. It's together we are one people. We must do everything right and then it goes. So it is. So whereas most motorsport is generally a solitary affair, in sidecar cross, your buddy is really important. My responsibility of the track is uh, very important to give on the right time the gas and brake so late as possible. My job is to open the throttle. Um, <laughs> I'm the one that gets us going, I'm the one who makes us move. But Jason's the one that stops me from crashing. He's the one that holds the sidecar down, holds the back wheel down on the corners. Um, so basically, you know, each, each one of us has got a job to do and we do it. No, I wouldn't say you have to be crazy. Um, you know, it's, it's no different to me driving my car. I just get on this bike and just do what I have to do without even thinking about it. But to somebody watching, yeah, they probably think oh, I'm a bit mad. When he makes a failure or something, uh, he's going too fast into a corner and the sidecar is coming up, I must pull to, m to make that it's coming down again. And uh, with a jump, when you go a little sideways or something, you must pull, then he's going straight again. This is as dangerous as it looks, and the lack of serious injury is testimony to the combined skills of both rider and passenger. It's 
start is very important, the most important thing on, uh, of, uh, of the race. First, the engine gets a lot of benzene, fuel. So I have to give a lot of gas to, to clean the bike. Change gears very fast, and then you must try to, to, to be uh, the fastest of the old 30 sidecars on the first line. Oh, that's fast. And, uh... Yeah, it's just a kick, you feel it inside, it's coming up. Victory for Sergis and Rasmus ensure that Latvia stay on top of the sidecar cross world. He's uh, different in his head. I don't know how it's possible to explain, but the, these boys are different, that's all. <laughs> Rule 17, two cars should never occupy the same piece of track. I refuse to believe that people will climb aboard a motorbike loaded with explosives. Contact in sport can be dangerous. But contact in some sports is part of the rules. Really need some points there. And Tennant having all sorts of bother and really look too for Pajerski. He's got to do all he can at 71. He puts him under the wall in place at the moment. Now he gets a bit of attention from 97, spins him round. There have been a few names in stock cars that have passed by the wayside, but not Frankie Wayman Jr. The current world champion races F1 stock cars in the UK, which is all about the fastest individual around the track. To be a good stock car racer, you've got to be able to judge what's going to happen in front of you. There's always going to be cars spinning out, crashing out, put people getting put out. You've got to be able to judge what they're going to do before they do it, really. Stock car racing in the UK has stayed pretty much the same as it was when the first World Championships were held in 1955. However, Steve Storm introduced stock car racing to New Zealand in 1959, and a very different form of stock car racing has evolved there. New Zealand is the stock car equivalent of the Galapagos Islands. New Zealand bumpers, with them running a lot heavier chassis, the bumpers are a lot longer, which covers the tyre completely. As you come round this side, you'll see the upright on the front corner of the bumper, which in England we run post and wire fences at some tracks. In New Zealand, they only run on concrete walls, so you won't see these on those cars. Well, this time they fix them up well and truly. 15, Damien Gray slams hard under the wall. So you'll see on the back wheels in this country, there's no protection around the wheels. It's an open wheel formula. In New Zealand, they run big, heavy fender guards around the wheels to protect the wheels. Team racing is the reason for all this armour plating. Down under, they go to war. Just how rough do you think it will get out there? Oh, it'll get very rough. We were here, uh, well, we were at the Teams Nationals last year in Palmerston North. They put cars on the roof, they put them up the wall, they nearly put them into the crowd. And boy, the crowd got behind it. Towns from throughout New Zealand race each other in what's developed into sophisticated car wars. Each team has four cars, one of which is designated as the runner, the other three cars on the team are the hired muscle. It's their job to protect their runner and take out the opposition. The first runner to complete eight laps wins. New Zealand's very, very popular. I mean, they, they close light companies down to go racing. They absolutely love the teams racing. The, the stadium at Palmston North is packed out. They actually shut the gates and pe some people can't get in on teams racing now. Well, this is the final event of the Teams Nationals for 1998. I've hedged my bets. I think Rotorua can do it. But then again, my predictions have been 100% wrong right throughout the series. So the initial plan is working as they wanted to. Rotorua in the front. Now Nelson come back hard at them. Remember, they hit very hard in this team's racing, and that's allowed one of the Nelson Tigers to get away, and get away he does, and straight into the back of Pat West.
Westerby. Westerby doing his best to put him off onto the infield, spins around. And off into the wall by the look of this. Well, 88 it was. Dave, the hitman here that's done the job once again for the Nelson Tigers, the Bradley Motor Company Nelson Tigers, as uh, Hickey just picks up the dregs. But really, that is the ball game, I would think. We've got four cars crowded out in the uh, cemetery turn. This is Dean Painter just worrying Pat Westerby as they go down the front straight. Spins him round. So perhaps the challenge is gone from the Rotorua Rebels. 5-1-5, Stan Hickey. He's going to take him on, though. He takes him on as they come down the front straight once again. He certainly stops one of them, but there's two more in reserve. The Nelson Tigers are doing a fantastic job here at Waikaraka Park. But so Painter in the front at the moment for the Nelson Tigers. Pat Westerby really the only one capable of doing any damage for the Rotorua Rebels. He lies in wait as they go down the front straight. There's been more damage done to these cars than I think I've ever seen in any stock car event before. Well, it was always going to be hot and heavy, and that's what we've got. But meantime, the Nelson boys come again. Stan Hickey trying to do the best he can. And it's the two Nelson boys that fix up Hickey. But, of course, there's still one more Nelson car in the fray, and that is 89, Dean Painter. He spins Pat Westbury, and the Nelson Tigers are going to win the team's nationals for 98. It's a volatile sport. Have a look at the crowd, you know. You don't even see this sort of crowd reaction at rugby. You know, it's wild. It's, it's, it's uh, modern-day gladiators, you know. It's tough stuff. This is a sport that began in Holland in the early 1980s at the Euro circuit Volkenwald. It was a great day out for all the family. Crowds as large as 10,000 used to turn up for the annual crazy racing extravaganza. And what's so crazy? The cars are racing backwards. There's really nothing else to it, they just race backwards. OK, they go upside down and into walls and into the grass and everything, but mainly they just race backwards. Crazy. If you're used to mounting the kerb, then the course designers have thrown in something just for you. They build a ramp on the finishing line so that absolute mayhem is guaranteed. If you've ever reversed the wrong way up a one-way street, just missing parked cars, then this sport is for you. The only skills you need are the ability to look over your shoulder whilst driving. Ideal for a taxi driver, then. At the end of the day, the crazy drivers celebrate with the traditional crazy winner's breakfast before they go to crazy bed and then wake up the day before. Now, is that crazy or what? Five, four, three, two, one. There's no way I'd get on a top fuel drag bike. No way at all. Have you seen them? These guys are mad. Seriously mad. Nobody is ever going to force you to get on a 12-foot motorbike and travel at speeds of over 200 miles per hour. Brian Johnson does it because he likes it. And he happens to be good at it. Winning in America is very special because you're running with the best people in the world. And if you beat the best in the world, then who is there left to beat? It's, it's almost like meeting God. When you're sitting on the start line with this motorcycle running, your heart rate is probably about 180 or somewhere in that region. And you are totally concentrated on what's about to happen because you're going to experience approximately 3G at the launch. <laughs> It will accelerate to 100 miles an hour in 1.7 seconds. It will accelerate to 190 in 4.1 seconds and somewhere over 200 in just over six seconds. And for anybody, you've got to be totally, utterly, exclusively concentrated. Otherwise, you're going to have an accident. That's the end of it. Better not have an accident then. Lest you ever wonder why they put wheelie bars on a bike, that's what happens when one breaks. This particular machine can go 228 miles an hour in a quarter of a mile from a standing start. That's not the fastest in the world. There are uh, one or two bikes in America that can go to uh, just over 230 miles an hour. Those bikes are ridden by Larry Spider-Man McBride and his main rival, the current world record holder, Tony Tiger Lang who has just put in a pass at 237 miles an hour. 
But that's not fast enough for him. The landmark is covering the quarter mile strip in under six seconds. That's one of our goals for this year is to accomplish the five second pass. Um, we ran 6.10 last weekend. Um, I, you know, the things are there. The conditions have to be right, though. The potential for these motorcycles, I think, is over 240 miles an hour because I don't think at this point in time we're getting the most from the combination that we've actually got. I think there's a lot more to come. Johnson goes. You see how he has to lead. That's the only form of steering they've got at those speeds. As far as uh, racing fuels are concerned, there are basically three fuels available. The first one is petrol, the second one is alcohol, and the third one is nitromethane. And there's an American adage which goes, gasoline is for washing parts, alcohol is for drinking, and nitro is for racing. And the reason they say that nitro is for racing is because of the way the fuel is constructed uh, in simple terms, as it burns, it gives you a lot more horsepower for free than the other fuels do. When you realise that something's gone wrong at speed, instinct will tell you to shut that throttle and grab the brakes really, really quickly. You won't have time to think about it. And if something's gone really wrong to the point where you are going to have an accident. Uh, you probably won't have the choice to get off, you'll probably be thrown off, but uh, if you do have a choice and there is a second to make that choice, then the best thing to do is bail out, otherwise you're in real trouble. They're crazy. They've got nothing to hold on to, I'm strapped in this, I can't fall out. I can fall off the back of those things. Uh, if you wanted to get off, the best way would be to roll off it, or if you've got, again, got time to think about it, which you probably won't, you'll have to sit up and let the wind blow you off it and take you over the back. Any way it goes, it's very, very dangerous. I admire the guys that do it, but phew, no way am I going to get on one of them. I can fall off a push bike. Having the opportunity to go as fast as you want without the law on your tail is just great. To be honest, they'd have a job keeping up with you, bro. In the next program, the ultimate four-wheel white knuckle ride. The last word in making waves. Why you should not carry passengers in a caravan. And up, up and away in the world's most frightening race.